we give them uh, a hand one more time? Thank you for leading us so well this morning. My name is Jason Lashana. I serve as director of chapel programs here at APU. And before I introduce our speaker, a couple of kind of reminders slash announcements. So next week is a three chapel requirement week. And there are two kind of new options that we have for the first time next week. The first one is Monday night. Any seniors in the house? <laughs> Senior chapel for the first time, 9 o'clock, UTCC. If you have senior standing, you are welcome and invited to attend. And then Thursday night, we have our first evening prayers chapel of the school year, 6 o'clock, UTCC. Um, come on out. It's always a great time of prayer and reflection together. So here at APU, we have really the gift of an outstanding faculty of professors, and occasionally we have some of those professors actually speak here in chapel, and this morning we have the gift of having one of those. Um, so Dr. Courtney Davis is an assistant professor of communication studies here at APU, where she teaches organizational, small group, and professional communication. She's passionate about teaching and mentoring both in and outside the classroom, equipping students for their post-collegiate endeavors and encouraging personal and professional growth in her students. Would you join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Courtney Davis. Thanks, Jason. Good morning. As an organizational communication scholar who researches and teaches about organizations, I read a lot about the workforce and the workplace. A few months ago, a Gallup poll reported that 51% of America's 100 million full-time workers aren't engaged at work, meaning they feel no real connection to their job, and they tend to do the bare minimum. Another 16% are actively disengaged, meaning that they resent their jobs. They tend to gripe and complain to their coworkers and they drag down office morale as a result. When we here at APU say that we graduate difference makers, there's clearly a great opportunity to make a difference in our work. This morning, I'd like to share with you a vision of the good work that God is calling you to do. Let's remember that in the creation of the world, starting at Genesis 1, God is described as having worked. In the first three days, God gives the world form, light, sky and seas, dry land. And in days three to six, God filled the world with birds, fish, land animals, light bearers. After God creates man on day six, verse 28 says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God commissioned Adam to carry on God's work. Having been created in God's image, Adam is invited to participate with God in engaging with the world. And as many of you know, two chapters later, the fall occurs. That's right, work came before the fall. So work was good a part of paradise. That's a game changer for us, or it should be, especially when we act as if work is burdensome, a necessary evil, even punishment. Work is not a thing to be dreaded, nor is it something we just have to do. We are made in God's image. He worked to create the heavens and the earth, so we should see work as a natural, God-given, and God-blessed activity of man. Thankfully, the story doesn't end in Genesis 3. Throughout the whole Bible, we are pointed to Jesus, who is sent by God to save us and to redeem all of creation. The gospel is that we have been saved by God through his son, Jesus Christ's death on the cross and resurrection. Do you believe that? Because if you believe that, and if you profess Christ as Lord, and if the gospel changes everything, then the gospel should change our hearts and our minds about this one thing called work. Yes, Jesus came to save us, but in a fuller sense, he came to redeem all of creation. And we must see our work as part of that redemption of all of creation. When we start to fully believe the gospel, 
And the work that God has given us is to participate with him in his creation and cultivation of the world, then we can be free to pursue many different kinds of work. There should not be a meaningful distinction between vocational ministry and marketplace ministry. They're both full-time ministry. In Christian workplaces and secular workplaces, we have multiple opportunities to glorify God. One of my most vivid memories of living in Santa Barbara was of my uh, then one and a half year old son, Luke, and the trash trucks. Trash trucks came barreling down our street nearly every day, and we had eight different kinds of trash bins. We had blue bins for recycling and brown bins for yard waste and black bins for trash. And then across the street was a large apartment complex that had those big dumpster bins, kind of like the ones you have in UV and in the dorms. So you can imagine, one and a half year old Luke was in truck heaven. When we would hear a truck coming down the street, he would sprint to our front door and my husband Matt or I would run after him and scoop him up and run out that front door to get to the curb to watch and wave. It really didn't even matter if Luke had pants on. <laughs> anyway, one day my husband Matt happened to ask the trash truck driver how often he was greeted as he was by our son Luke. His response, every other block. What an incredible thing to think that someone picking up our trash on a daily basis, who maybe society looks down upon as doing menial and dirty work, he was seen as a hero to nearly every kiddo under the age of five, enjoying the cheers and waves and adoration on the job every other block. In God's kingdom, as he seeks to redeem the world, the trash truck driver's job can be just as important and God-honoring as mine, working as a professor at a God-first university. Let's not elevate vocational ministry or vocational work over corporate work. Let's not elevate nonprofit work over for-profit work. Let's not decide what has more value to God. If Jesus came to redeem all of creation and God asks us to participate with him in this redemptive work, then there also should not be a meaningful distinction between paid work and unpaid work. It's strange because so many people work 40 plus hours a week, sometimes even 60 or 80. And when you ask them how they serve the Lord, they say that they volunteer at church on Sundays or they give financially to charities, the church, or missionaries. Shouldn't we seek to glorify God every day with whatever he has us doing, whether or not it's paid? In addition to my now four-year-old son, Luke, my husband Matt and I have another little guy named Theo, and he turns two next month. I always thought I would stay home with kids or at least work only part-time. But because of a perfectly timed job opportunity, the leadership of my husband, and God's provision, I get to work. Sure, it's still work, and there are days that are downright challenging. Frustration, annoyance, doing things I don't necessarily want to do. But I get to work. And I get to work here, of all places. Because if I'm really honest with you, this is my easier job. Without a doubt, working with you people is a whole lot easier than caring for and disciplining two toddler boys day in and day out. There are some days you give, me, you give them a run for their money. What I'm learning is that both my paid work as a PhD holding faculty member and my unpaid work as a wife, mom, sister, daughter, friend, volunteer, all of those present multiple opportunities for me to glorify God in my work. And I need not compare them one to another. I must not choose to sacrifice my family or friendships or commitment to lead a growth group at church on the altar of my work. But I must also choose not to sacrifice the quality of my teaching or my research because I'm investing in relationships or enjoying time with family and friends. I have important work to do in both my home and my office, but either work on their own are perfectly sufficient callings unto the Lord. 
and God gives us enough mercy to contend with, ever, with whatever it is that he asks us to manage. If Jesus came to redeem all of creation and God asks us to participate with him in this work to redeem all of creation, then all work, ministry or marketplace, nonprofit or for-profit, paid or unpaid, all this work presents opportunities for us to honor the Lord. Okay, fine. What does this mean for you and the work that you pursue after you graduate? Dorothy Sayers, an early 20th century British writer, wrote this. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sunday. But what the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. When I first read that years and years ago, that message strongly resonated with me that we ought to be doing darn good work and pursuing excellence. Because as she says, a work, a building cannot be good architecture. Sorry, a building must be good architecture before it can be a good church. And a painting must be well painted before it can be a good sacred picture. She says this, work must be good work before it can be God's work. No matter your major or intended career field, all of us as the body of Christ, let's together work in all sectors of society, believing and then acting on that belief that God wants to redeem all of creation. No matter your position or your title, whether you have one or not, be the most creative and diligent people in the world because in our work with him, we get to participate with the diligent creator of the universe. So be diligent and creative in art, in music, in storytelling, but also in decision making, in product innovation, in bodily health and healing, in spiritual counseling and vocational ministry. A few months ago, the pastor of our church was teaching from the book of Galatians, and he suggested that through the whole of our lives, we live out and preach who it is that we serve, and the grace that we enjoy. What gospel are we preaching? What are we demonstrating as true or false about the person of Jesus Christ by the whole of our lives, including our work? Does our work and our lives appropriately elevate Christ and his work in the world? Part of my salvation story is that I met Jesus as a junior at the University of Southern California in a sorority of all places. Unlikely story, I know, but creative God, right? I came to know Christ through a group of smart, ambitious fraternity guys and sorority girls who were doing things with their lives. I saw their work and I wanted to know why and how they did what they did. They were diligent, they had purpose and vision, and their good work reflected an incredible creator. Let me suggest to you that both the work we produce and the ways in which we do that work reflect who or what we worship. And it has to be both. Understanding this theology of work means we can no longer be satisfied with just being the nice people in the office. With Christ, let's do the big things and the little things faithfully. Calling something of mediocre quality Christian inadvertently communicates that we serve a fairly mediocre God. Remember what Dorothy Sayers says, work must be good work before it can be God's work. Last fall, I had an opportunity to speak to a group of college students with a large Christian parachurch organization on a similar topic about God's work. And a professional staff member pulled me aside afterward and admitted his frustration that sometimes colleagues settled for mediocrity and then said, well, God's grace will cover that. What? <laughs> no. With the Lord, let's pursue excellence. Let's not do mediocre work and bank on the Lord shoring up where we lack, but instead, darn good work done with thoughtfulness, 
bodily strength and the right heart through the Holy Spirit is indeed a righteous sacrifice unto the Lord. To best reflect our diligent creator, let's free ourselves and others to pursue excellent work in all sectors of society. So I'm hoping at this point you're on board with me, that you're gonna go do darn good work. But I wanna make sure that I make myself very clear. Darn good work doesn't mean that it is without hardship. It's very possible that culture and Christian culture have communicated unrealistic expectations for many of us to perfectly find and discern our calling and to live out all of our strengths and all of our giftings and all of everything that we are in our work when the reality is that God sends his beloved people into dark places, and many of you have been and will be purposefully placed in jobs, volunteer organizations, families, and cities that won't seek your good. Maybe in your first job after graduation, you don't feel like you're living out your calling, or your strengths aren't being fully used, or you don't have a supervisor that's invested in your personal and professional development. Maybe you don't have people in your workplace who share your belief in Christ. Remember this, God is sovereign, he is good, and he is for you. And he has really important work for you to do, sometimes in hard work with difficult people in dark places. What if we saw our work as part of the Great Commission? All of us in various sectors of society. Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Skip to Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Yes, go and make disciples of all the nations. Take the gospel to the ends of the earth into remote bushes in the jungle to unreached people. But unreached people also are sitting in cubicles and offices and high-rise buildings. The Great Commission is for missionaries locally, nationally, and internationally, but they're also for the missionaries who work in the marketplace and drive an hour or more each way to the office. Those who persevere and stay in remote jungles and concrete jungles, in villages and jobs and industries that don't seek their good, those that persevere in those places and stay true to the gospel are indeed a large and critical part of the Great Commission. If you want to make a difference in the world, go into the world. God did not save us to huddle together and keep to ourselves. And if you're called to the pulpit or church or missionary work, God bless you. Steward this message as an exhortation to equip and send out others with a robust theology of work so that they understand God's plan to redeem the wor world is in part through their work. What does all of this mean for you now? Here in week two of fall semester? These short seasons that we get to share with you are mostly about cementing your identity in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and equipping you with an intellectual suitcase for engaging with the world. And when we all do our part, you as students, we as faculty and staff, you are prepared to work as an expression of your identity in Christ. So press in. If you've caught this vision for participating with God in redeeming the whole world through all sectors of society, then you must buy in to your education here. Do not fall into the trap of believing that only your action teamwork, volunteer work, D group, involvement in res life or student life counts to the glory of God. All of that for sure counts. But your classwork counts too. I think some of you approach your education like my son Luke did while packing and moving this summer. He wanted to help 
And so I gave him a box and asked him to put in the box whatever he thought he would need in the new house. And so 20 minutes later, he brought the box back to me, half full. Three train tracks, three trains, four cars, a book, a bouncy ball, and a stuffed zebra. No clothes, no bath soap, no bed sheets. You get the point. In his short-sightedness, he decided what he thought he needed and didn't even fill it to the brim. Are you getting where I'm going with that? I'm pretty sure that there are at least a few of you who approach your classes like that. You love Jesus, but you don't see the value in this particular class, so you skip it or you barely skate by. You decide that this particular assignment is busy work, so you give it half the attention that it deserves. Or you read a journal article or a textbook chapter only to figure out what is on the exam. Can you be faithful in the little things this semester? Can you read that article or that chapter trusting that in and of itself, that is good work, regardless of what is on the exam? Your work is an extension of God's work. Even the one-page reflection papers and the mundane textbook chapter readings, those are opportunities to glorify God. Don't fall into the trap of short-sightedness. In God's sovereignty, he will use all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Don't miss out on the equipping that is possible this semester. But if you can't see it, if you have no idea how this class or this assignment fits into your equipping, ask. I had a student just last year come to my office and say to me that she was preparing to go abroad to do missions work and understood the value of some of her communication studies courses. Interpersonal and relational communication, persuasion and attitude change, conflict management, intercultural communication. But she didn't understand how my class, communication and organizations, focusing on hierarchy and structures and cultures of organizations, she didn't understand how that fit in her future career plans. Basically, she was asking, why does this matter? I saw this conversation as a great challenge to help her and other students see how this particular class contributed to kingdom building and God's plan to redeem the world. Do that. Ask tough questions of your professors. Give them an opportunity to partner with you in your equipping and in preparing you to do good work. If you believe the gospel and want to be obedient to and part of his great commission, trust in his equipping and steward all of your work unto the Lord. Okay, let me briefly talk about rest before I send you back out to work or rest because it is Friday. Back to Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Repetition in scripture usually means this is important. God worked with diligence and creativity and then he rested content in a finished work. If work and rest are seen through that Genesis lens, then work is good and rest is designed to recharge us to go back to doing good work. It's not that only our leisure time is good and work is necessary for us to make money so that we can truly experience life. Let's not have a case of the Mondays and celebrate hump day and root to fry yay. <laughs> Work and rest, it's all supposed to be good. Want to be a difference maker? Be a diligent worker who rests well. Rested, diligent Christians are rare, downright countercultural. Be rested, diligent, creative Christians following a God who modeled just that. What a powerful affirmation of the gospel and the God that we serve. Let me pray. 
Lord, thank you for the good work that you have given and are giving us to do this semester at APU. I pray we would grow more and more into the likeness of your son, working creatively and diligently in all sectors of society, resting well, playing hard, becoming equipped difference makers all for your glory. Help us to grow more in awe of you and your plan to redeem the whole world through the work of our hands, our heads, and our hearts. I pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.